Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns. I'm Simon Kutis and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Welcome back to the show, everyone. And it's an absolute privilege to be joined by not one guest, but two guests. We have Casey Ellis, who's the founder and chief strategy officer of Bug Crowd, and also Dave Gerry, who's the CEO of Bug Crowd. And today's actually a really special uh, podcast because it's the first time we've actually had a, the, the dynamic of two guests in, on the same show. And I think what's really interesting and the thing that we really want to unpick as part of this is, you know, that relationship between the founder and the CEO yeah. and, you know, what, what that kind of interaction is. But before we go into kind of unpicking that, just want to start with a bit of an introduction, a bit of a background. We'll start with yourself first, Casey. Sure. Just give us a little bit about your background because it's, it's a really interesting beginning. Yeah, no, definitely. And thanks for having us on. Um, Background wise, I mean, you know, what Bug Crowd does, we're, we're focused in cybersecurity and, and we basically harness hackers to do stuff. And, and that really is partly a product of my own background. You know, grew up hacking stuff as a kid, got into the technical side of security, um, did penetration testing for a number of years, switched over onto the dark side and got into sales for a period. And then I got it in my head that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So, you know, prior to Bug Crowd, I was looking at different ways that security was being solved. Um, on top of the fact that like the community that I came from, you know, hackers that think like criminals, but don't want to be criminals, if that makes sense. Um, we're all kind of waiting at the table, trying to help out and, and not really getting the invite. So those seemed like dumb problems to have. And, you know, at one point in time, the light bulb went off and I scribbled on a napkin and bug credit was kind of the product of that. I mean, it's, an, it's an amazing story. And obviously you've created an incredible company, which is, you know, has affinity both from customers but the community and, mm. and, and as a, it's an industry defining organization yeah. and i think obviously the humble the, the beginnings you know your, your background your passion your flair for that i think it's a real testament to what you've actually created appreciate that <laughs> dave obviously you come from a slightly different background yeah. uh, so kind of just give us a bit of a summary of where where did it all begin for you yeah so like casey i spent most of my career in cyber right so i kind of grew up in this industry worked for some really amazing companies always on the revenue side so kind of came up through the sales side of the house and had an opportunity to join this company, uh, White Hat Security, where that was definitely a ride for about six years. Um, and there I really got an opportunity to kind of learn the operations and the delivery side and took on this kind of dual CRO, COO function that really helped kind of set me up to be able to partner up with Casey and, and yeah. come over to Bug Crowd. Yeah. Obviously, during your time there, you, you were obviously working with – a number of the kind of the playbook community that the, the, the community that yeah. you know a whole podcast series so you've been exposed to elite selling you know not just selling the conventional you know the conventional yeah. selling you've been exposed to what exceptional selling looks like very elite totally. to an elite level and that's obviously served you well because that's the foundations oh, right i mean that's ultimately where i learned my skill set right was learn from people that were at PTC and BMC, right? I mean, guys like Jack Napoli were the ones that taught me medic, right? So I got to learn from guys like that and then have the opportunity to work with. We were talking kind of before we started, guys like Mark Musselman and Dave Boyle and Jim Wilson and others that kind of had an opportunity to kind of see, okay, what worked really well for them throughout their careers? How do I Davify that a little bit, put my own twist on it, my own kind of personality into it? But then set it up where you have that really strong foundation. And then over the course of your career, you just build on it, right? But to your point, I mean, had an opportunity to learn from some of the best in, in the very early days of my career. So did you always believe you were going to be transitioning kind of out of core sales into something where well, you're currently CEO, CEO but yeah. there is obviously a few steps that <laughs> to get to CEO. So just kind of fill in some of those blanks, actually. Yeah, I mean, I always had the desire to get here. Did I think it would necessarily happen this quickly? No, right? I don't think any of us can say, hey, I'm going to be a CEO at this particular point in time. I think it's more you set yourselves up, you do the best you can to learn along the way, and you build a team of really good people. And, and that, to me, is the only way that I would have any level of confidence stepping into this role is the team that we surrounded ourselves with, right? Some of the best management members, management team members that I've ever had an opportunity to work with are now here at Bug Crowd. So... That makes it a hell of a lot easier for my job to be able to step into the role and know that I've got a founder that that can partner with me and be a core part of the business going forward, bring on a lot of the team that I've had an opportunity to work with throughout my career. 
And then a lot of great folks. I mean, our CRO, I didn't know him before I came to Bug Crowd. We were able to find him and bring him on board. And that's been an awesome relationship. So kind of seeing it come together for me is the part that I'm really excited about. It's been just over a year now. Um, and yeah, having right. kind of looking forward, which is crazy, <laughs> yeah, uh, is. <laughs> but kind of looking forward, it's like, great. What are the next three, four, five, six years going to look like? And how do we continue to build upon that? So yeah, it's, it's been a fun ride so far. It's an interesting story from how you got to bug crowds and how the, the journey at bug crowd started yeah. for you. Maybe you can just share with some of our audience on, on that journey and how, how you are and where you are today. Yeah. So I started as a customer. So I met Casey seven years ago sounds about right kind of looking yeah. at each other trying to decipher <laughs> how long ago that really was there's the um, blip years in there so it, you know can get a, <laughs> a little blurry. fuzzy sometimes yeah. uh yeah so started as a customer um when we were at white hat or i was at white hat we were selling like 6500 pen tests a year hmm. and i was responsible for the delivery side of the organization at that point so trying to figure out how are you ever going to staff a bench of talent for 6500 pen test a year and you'd get these big spikes. And I came across this company bug crowd that had this really cool model of leveraging and kind of harnessing the capacity and creativity that exists in the hacker community and being able to drive outcomes for customers. So had an opportunity to sit down with Casey, learned a little bit more and realized, okay, this can be something that's really powerful for our customers that we can drive value from started as a customer. I think yep. I was bug crowds first million dollar customer. Yeah, you were. If I don't, if I'm not mistaken, um, and then had an opportunity. We did a bunch of go-to-market partnership stuff together. Yep. I was an advisor for the company for a number of years. So for me, it was a no-brainer, right? I knew a lot of the board members uh, already. I knew a lot of the management team that was here. Obviously, had a great relationship with Casey. So there was an opportunity for me to come join the business full-time. It was a no-brainer, right? I mean, this is where I always wanted to be. Yeah. So, yeah, super excited for uh, kind of how it's played out. There's a there's a part of that that's um, that goes back even further as well uh, in, in terms of the relationship that um, we had with Jeremiah Grossman and some of the kind of founding team yeah. at White Hat. So. I actually lent on, on on Jeremiah and R Snake as kind of startup mentors in in the founder CEO. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it was interesting because like that didn't feed directly into the commercial conversations that we had with White Hat, but it was you know we were already starting to kind of draw alongside each other through that period. So I think when that all came about, there was a lot of stuff that was already set up well. Um, yeah. In that sense, so you know when we started yeah. talking, it's like okay, it's aligned, <laughs> and then Dave could see what we're able to do behind the scenes. Obviously that gave us the opportunity to connect, yeah. connect and get to know each other. And frankly, for me to see some of the stuff that, you know, you were talking about before in terms of your, your career path, just the credibility that, uh, that Dave's built along the way. I, yeah. I think that, that kind of execution pathway, when it came time to talk about, you know, him potentially coming on as CEO for Bug Crowd, it felt yeah. like a no brainer because all of that stuff was evident at that point in time. Yeah. So where were you as an organization before you got introduced to, to, to Dave? Well, I mean, in, in the sense of the, the customer piece, we were growing. Yeah. Um, where were we? Seven years ago. So I'd, I basically did the founder CEO role uh, at Bug Crowd for the first six years. Um, and then, you know, pretty much went to have a conversation with the board and said, hey, um, need a grown up essentially <laughs> and, and they found was, you and, well no actually so this is this is this is v1 so and so that conversation really went along the lines of you know bug crowd pretty clearly um and obviously hit problem solution fit and proof of pain fit in market like very early right. on like the whole idea of the way that we're you know basically applying human resource to solve security problems kind of sucks um yeah. You know, there's there's this huge potential in the in the white hat community around the world. Like, how do we make it more efficient? That that got legs very quickly after we yeah. started and, and kind of kicked the category off. So the whole thing was a little bit like riding, you know, like lighting the fuse on the on the back of a rocket and then kind of learning <laughs> to fly it as it took <laughs> off, right? Yeah. Which you know, frankly, I, I I reveled in that and enjoyed that in that role for for a chunk of time. But it got to the point where it's like, if I'm limiting this because yeah, you know, the kind of experience that I have in my background isn't the same as people like Dave. I don't want to put a glass ceiling on on this business for that reason. Well, that, um, that goes both ways so big, too, right? right? I mean, I don't have the experience or skill set to go found a company and build something from scratch, right? So I think that's what 
That's for what me it, yeah. makes this partnership work so well is that 100%. I think we're both self-aware enough to be like, hey, that's not what I do. That's yeah. not what I'm good at. Yeah. That's what you're amazing at. So I need you to do that and let's divide and conquer. 100%. A- and that's where I think a lot of these relationships start to go off the rails is when yeah. there's kind of the how to like butting heads on who's responsible for what, where's the like there's not a clear line of separation. Yeah. There's a lot of gray area and you have to be comfortable living within that fuzziness yep. of, okay, who does what at what time and just have really honest conversations around like, Hey, let's go do this together. This is really powerful to work on together. Or, yep. Hey, I've got a million things going on. Like, can you please own this and run this? Or exactly. can you please take this on or vice versa? Exactly. Um, and I think that's at least from my perspective, what's worked really well. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. That's actually good. Cause you know, it's happened back to the question. The first go around, um, we brought someone in what Dave is describing right now. Isn't really how that played out. Right. Um, I, I think there were a lot of things that got, um, that got, you know, improved from a, from a business, you know, efficiency, operational efficiency, yeah. cleanliness standpoint, all that, all that kind of stuff. There was a decent set of outcomes that happened through that period. Uh, but it got to the point where it's like, okay, those things that Dave's talking about don't necessarily exist within the business. We need to start thinking about someone that we can bring into lead yeah. that actually brings that in. Cause as a founder, like I've got, you know, this thing's got so much runway left in it. I, I feel like we're not even scratching the paint Haven't off, even started. Off, the, off the potential of, of what we can actually do yeah. as a category and as a company. And I'm thrilled to still be involved in it. You know what I mean? It's like 11 years in, usually yeah. founders kind of do the CEO yeah. switch and they, they piece out yeah, after yeah, a year yeah. or two. You know, the reason I haven't done that is because I believe in it and it's, and it's still fun and there's still, you know, so much kind of runway and, and, and kind of future, you know, picture to it. So getting to meet Dave, it's like, okay, this is the right guy for, for the role like ceo is a heady gig yeah. it's, it's one of those things where if you've got the right character the right personality and the right set of skills you bring into it then i believe you can execute on that and actually do it well and the more i'd gotten to know dave over the years when the time came to start to think about who we could bring into that seat it's like he's already here so that was the other part david actually just joined that's right bug crowd as coo a couple of months before yeah beginning of august of yeah. that year yeah. yeah so you know as we're looking around that was the moment where it's like wait a sec they already work here it's dave yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah so you know it was it was a really nice setup in that sense i think having been through um that transition of ceo thing twice now once being me and the other being you know yeah. dave's predecessor um this is definitely the cleanest version of that yeah. that i've seen personally and yeah. it's, it's a good thing in that sense and so sitting there in the coo seat did that give you the ability and the I suppose the lens that you needed to be able to look in on this and see where the gaps were, where what needed to happen, and then to help forge that relationship. So I think the the relationship was there yeah. kind of from day one, yeah. right? Yeah. So there there really was no weirdness or awkwardness or kind of that normal adjustment period yeah, yeah. because we yeah, knew each true. other so well. Yeah. So for me, it felt like old homecoming to come to Bug Crowd because these were people I had already worked with for a number of years, right? Albeit mm. slightly in a different format. I think in terms of coming in on the CEO seat, COO seat, it gave me the ability to really focus my time on, okay, let's look at the underlying kind of framework of the business. Let's look at what infrastructure yeah. exists today, what doesn't exist, and really start to think about scalability. Yep. Yeah. So when we got to the point of now it's time, and this is why, again, having a go-to-market background has been powerful in this role – okay, now it's time to turn on the jets, right? We've got the revenue engine. We've got the right people in place. Well, you better make sure that you, your business is fit for purpose from an actual infrastructure and scalability perspective. And 100%. that's what the first three, four months, hiring the right people, we rebuilt our finance organization, rebuilt or actually I think built for the first time like a true rev ops deal desk yeah, organization, correct. have a killer leader in there, rebuilt the marketing engine from the ground up, rebuilt the people function of business. Like that all happened to a vast degree before I stepped into the CEO role. Hmm. So that by the time I stepped into the role, it was already a team that was built. We had kind of a working cadence together. Many of these were people that I was able to bring in. And and that I think helped accelerate me in the seat quite a bit because it is a steep ramp. Like it, it's a hard thing to explain. What does it mean to go from COO or CRO to CEO? Like nothing really changes but in the same vein everything yeah, changes all yeah, at the yeah, exact yeah, yeah, same yeah. time so it's like yeah. all right how That's do you true. actually articulate that and being surrounded by people 
that in often oftentimes are much better than me. Like that was yeah. the thing for me is like, all right, like our CRO, I think is a better CRO than I ever was. Right. And that's a powerful thing. Now I think I drove our, our agency a little crazy um, <laughs> because I think he was probably the 30 or 40th candidate that right. I went through. Yeah. Um, but it's also helped us get to the point now where I have complete trust. Right. And mm. that for me was the important thing of like, Okay, it's easy for me to say I trust our finance leader, right? I've worked with him for a number of years. He's fantastic. But when you have somebody new joining the business, especially where that's where I feel I'm strongest, the last thing we want is for me to feel, oh, I've got to go play CRO. That's not good for anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a really powerful yeah. thing. So I think that helped, right? The relationship yeah. that we had coming in and then the ability just to bring people on really quickly that were great. And what, I mean, what I'd say, <clears throat> just, you know, shout outs where they're well and truly due. I think that, you know, the combination of the context that you had coming in from, the, you know, that period um, in the CEO seat and also previously as an advisor and customer, then also the the kind of trust that you had and the team that was yeah. brought in, yeah, right? Yeah. When you shift into CEO, because like your job as CEO is ultimately like make sure there's enough money in the bank, make sure everyone knows where the North Star is and then get the right people doing the right things and get the hell out of the way. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is really hard to do when you're coming out of an operating role because you're used to being, you know, at least to a, a greater degree than in the CEO seat, hands in the weeds. So it enabled your ability to shift Totally. Because you had that context and that trust. And I, yeah, I, yeah, I think for what that's... I've seen you do that like incredibly over the past 12 months because it's a big shift. Right? And how, how'd you go through that journey? What, what, what is it? How do you take yourself from that, that frame of mind and that knowledge and how do you bridge the gap? It's tough. Right. It's really tough, right? Because now sure. you don't have anybody else to look up to, right? Normally, if you're an IC, an IC yeah, you've got your first line to look up to. You've got some level line. of direction, yeah, no yeah, matter yeah. How, how good you are as an IC or, or, or somewhere in the organization. I think th there's a lot of great people around the business, right? So our board is incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. So there's been some really amazing people to tap into on that side of things. We look at who are some of the advisors we have around the business. How do I learn from them? And how do you make sure you have true operators around the business as well, right? Not to say that VCs and, and the direction they can give from a financing standpoint isn't important, but it's also how do you think about getting people that have been in the seat that have done that transition? Yeah. Where can I learn what worked really well yeah. for them? What didn't work well for them? Where did they falter that maybe I can try to avoid? And it's also looking even at the management team, right? So how can I lean on members of the management team and also have very honest conversations with them to say, hey, if I'm getting too in your business, I need you to feel comfortable telling me that. Doesn't mean I'm going to totally back away, mm -hmm. but I need you to feel comfortable having that conversation. And I think that's where, for me, that was the hardest part is like you realize that when you step into the role, you're accountable and responsible for everything. But from a day-to-day -day operational standpoint, you, you're not in the weeds, you're right? To what you said, you're arm's length, time. but you're yeah. accountable for it. So how yeah. do you coach and direct and mentor the team so that they can step up and do it? And they're amazing functional leaders. And for me, I look at my role of like orchestration. How do I make sure that all the functions are communicating effectively? How do I make sure that there is somebody kind of looking across the business to say, okay, what we're doing here is going to drive value here. It's going to drive value here, making sure the organization is speaking to each other the mm -hmm. way that they should. Right. And a lot of this sounds like basics, but it's just making sure that you build that culture and cadence into the organization so that that's happening mm -hmm. on its own. And then you drive accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So the same way that as a salesperson, I was held accountable to a number. We hold each other accountable as a leadership team to, hey, yeah. these are our three goals. And that for me was one of the most surprising things coming into Bug Crowd is when I asked for, hey, what's our list of priorities? It was like 40 things. Right, yeah. right. And it's, okay, if that's our goals for the year, then we don't have any prioritization at all, yeah. right? So what are the, as we went into the first fiscal year with me as CEO, it was, okay, hang on. What are the three things yeah. we need to accomplish this year? How do we drive like immense actually, value? Actually create a sense of priority. Totally. <laughs> like, how do we drive value for our yeah. customers, for the hacker community, and for employees? That's it. If we can do those th three things well, the rest of it's going to take care of itself. right? We're not going to talk about what is our outcome going to be. Are we going to sell the company? Are we going to IPO the company? All of that is on the table at the right point in time. Right now, it's how do we build the right amount of value, pull people together around a common mission, yep. do the right thing, and make sure that ultimately whatever happens, happens, right? Yep. The rest of that is like, we'll play that out as we get there. Mm -hmm. yep. But it's, let's make sure we're building 
an organization, for me, what's most important is that when we look at this thing 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we look at this and we say, okay, people in this organization point back to Bug Crowd and that's where I got my start, yeah. right? That's where I learned. That's yeah. how I built my career. 100%. That's why we've built the next generation of CROs or CMOs or VPs of ops, right? Or hackers or whatever it is that we've actually, they can point back and say, that's where I got my start. Yeah. As a founder, it's incredibly progressive. We, we see this time and time again. You know, a lot of founders want to just hold on you know they want to they want to control they want to no. you know it becomes <laughs> and, and, so at that time when you realized i need someone else what was going through your mind what would you take take us take us back to that time yeah so i, I wrote a blog post probably 2014 or so 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 bug crowd started working on it in in you know roughly 2012 um went through an accelerator program uh, beginning in 2013 and it was kind of off to the races from there. And and a lot of that, it's interesting hearing Dave talk about the, the COO to CEO experience because it's very similar going going from founder to you know founder CEO through those early stages of, of expanding and scaling into a team. Because um, as, a, as a founder, like your job is to basically do and understand everything. Yeah. Uh, but then as you grow, like your job increasingly becomes to do nothing effectively like you're, you're there literally to quarterback it's not right. nothing but you know compared to what it was it, it certainly feels like that so it's super counterintuitive um <clears throat> especially when you like I'm, I'm just a massive nerd for this stuff like uh, i'm genuinely interested in all different aspects of the business and i get kind of drawn towards those things so that was always a, a natural inclination that i had to fight in some ways um and um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the journey heading up into, like I said before, you know, we, we had very clear kind of thesis fit in, in the market at that point in time. You know, the other funny thing from a, a timing standpoint, we landed in America for the first time the same month that Snowden, um, the Snowden revelations, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I kind of look back through, like I've been in security since high school, right? And I look at that as the point that, you know the the average person collectively realized that security is kind of a thing like prior to that it was basically standing on street corners trying to get people to care and and that to me was one of the first moments where it became a retail politics issue and and actually a consumer-led issue so yeah. the entire industry caught a huge tailwind right at the same time that we're starting by crowd and it was a trip like the whole thing just whoosh, off it went from there um so, you know, I think heading to your question, um, you know, what was the thinking around that? It was really, you know, what's the best for the business? Like <clears throat> there's a, it's a very, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to other founders, did similar things to Dave in terms of like connecting with founders that had gone on and been successful. Like my approach to mentorship is you find people that have been where you are, gone where you want to go and ideally a little bit further like humble yourself to ask them really stupid questions. And then basically the tricky part is ignoring 90% of what they tell you because you're not handing them the steering wheel. <laughs> you're trying to understand how they think in ways that can inform how, how, yeah. how you think, right? That's usually the part that people screw up. But you, you've also built that as a core part of the culture at Bug Crowd too, right? Try so you've to, done yeah. a really good job. I appreciate that. Maintaining that as a part of the culture and that there is no stupid question. There yeah. is mm -hmm. no, yeah. like self-awareness is a positive thing, right? And that's, again, it sounds like basics, but vulnerability is not a sign of weakness. No, well, right? vulner vulnerability is inherent to strength ultimately, right? right? If, if, you, if, you, if you're so kind of set on being correct about a thing um, that you're not prepared to be vulnerable, you know, when that fails, eventually it fails catastrophically instead of gracefully if you, you're trying to improve yourself along the way. So like, yeah, these, these are all kind of, you can see patterns in what we do as a company kind of feeding into, yeah. you know, how I think about leadership and just growth um, as a business. But yeah, you know, the, <clears throat> the conversation with the board pretty much went to the effect of like, we all want the same things, you know, like bug crowd will always be like my, my kid. Um, mm -hmm. But at some point, you know, kids leave home and go to high school or they go off and get married, all those different things. Um, you know, I, I want to see it be as successful as it can possibly be. And I want to make sure that the right people are leading it and, and guiding it through the process. Um, I'm starting to feel like I'm struggling with that because, you know, the other side of it candidly was it was getting kind of tough. Like the, uh, you know, the, the, the stress levels and all those different things. It was first go around, um, first go at a venture back startup and 
it did what bug crowd did. Um, mm. That's a lot. And I felt like I handled it well for a period there, but then it got tricky. Mm. So, you know, talking to the board about it and saying, hey, what should we do? Um, that just became a collaborative conversation where we started to search and, and kind of off it went. We found obviously Dave's predecessor in that process. Yeah. That The good thing about that, I think there was things about that that I do differently next time around. Um, probably av avoiding burnout would be one of them. <laughs> and that's yeah. something that I talk to a lot of founders about these days because yeah. there's some things that I can look back on in hindsight and say, that's a thing I would have done differently. But the good part about it was it, did, it definitely helped um, kind of prepare for the conversations that led to Dave's appointment where it's like, okay, here are the things that I believe we actually really need as a business. This is you know my involvement. This is where I'm going to be involved. This is where I'm going to stay the hell out of the way as much as I can to let him do his thing. Going back to what you were saying before around taking hands off the wheel as founder. And I think so far so good. It's been a journey, that's for sure. How does the, you know, how do you ensure that this, with passing on the baton, passing on the responsibility to other individuals, how does it stay fresh and how does it stay exciting for you as, as a, in the seat that you're in at the moment? I mean, I think so. So you know, Dave's talking uh, like you, you talked a lot about the the CRO and the operational experience. Yeah. I think the other thing that that we really clicked on is that he's he's kind of a security geek as well, um, and and that's normally attributed to you know the not the CRO side, the more kind of the technical side of things. Um, but when we're talking about the actual problem solution fit and solving things in the market, there there was always like basically I trust you know, his, his understanding of that aspect of what we're doing and, and we connect a lot on, on that yeah. side of things. So, yeah, I think that that was a key part of it um, coming into it. I mean, staying excited is, yeah, I can see line of sight to the bigger picture. Like Bug Crowd was always about like, let's change the way that, you know, we view the cybersecurity playing field. There's this idea of the defender's dilemma and the fact that we have to, you know, outsmart all of the adversaries that are out there, that's impossible mm. with, you know, one person being paid by the hour or, you know, whatever automation's up to at the time because they're just going to out-compete that because that's their job as bad guys, right? Mm. Like the idea of being able to level that out um, and engineer creativity into the gaps that exist and continually do, do, do that regardless of what pops up, you know, AI, quantum, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There's all these different things that might happen in the future. We're ready for that. Because yeah. it's a it's a creative set of problems that we've got access to that we can engineer into the gaps that that creates from a from a security standpoint. I get jazzed about that, mm -hmm. right? Because like that was my vision starting the company. It's not just bug bounty or VDP or any of these particular products. It's like humans are a part of the solution long term. Let's lock that in, and and like basically transform the way that this stuff gets done. Yeah, you know, what we've done so far is impressive i'm proud of it i'm proud of everyone who's worked on it but it's like we said before just kind of scratching the paint off and i get genuinely excited about that because i want to yeah. see it done so do you feel you're in the ideal seat that you would you know if you could have ever carved out the perfect job the perfect role for you you're now sat in that right in the perfect seat because you've got yeah it, the, the business side you, you strike me as, as you said somebody that loves technology you love getting involved with the strategy yeah, I mean, I think this is this is a common thing for founders, but I, you know, I definitely think that I'm, you know, kind of a poster child for the idea of like a founder doesn't ever really have a clear bucket, yeah, that they fit in. Because I love sales, I love marketing. You know, I view a decent chunk of the the problem that we've had to solve over the past ten years is evangelism. Yeah, and like literally, you know, the first five years of Bug Crowd was explaining to the market that hackers aren't always evil. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Literally, which is a marketing problem. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I, I I see I see the whole thing as basically building Bug Crowd as a machine, not just a technology solution or a crowd solution or a, right. or a GTM solution. It's the entire engine that mm. works. Um, and the fact that, you know, in the strategy role and in the founder role, like I think founder, you know, the fact that you're doing a little bit of everything's kind of intractable from, from that title. That's just sort of goes with the gig and that's fine. Um, but defining it more closely into, into this chief strategy officer title, um, it is the perfect gig in a lot of ways because it's, you know, it gives me the opportunity to feed into different parts of the business that are going to create the most leverage into whatever next thing we're, we're pursuing. What do you think are the fundamentals that are required for this dynamic to work? Trust, I, I think, is yeah. yeah, is kind of the biggest thing. 
Yeah, I think it's trust and it's just kind of dropping the ego at the door, mm-hmm. right? And realizing like, hey, we're in this together. We're, we're marching towards a common goal. We don't have to agree every single day. In yeah. fact, we shouldn't agree every single yeah. day. If we, if we agree every day, then clearly we're not pushing the boundaries far enough and we're not yeah. having the real discussion and the real conversation. Yep. But it's also have those conversations, have those debates. And then when you leave the room, it's a united front, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And it's, hey, 100%. let's go march out with the rest of the management team. Yeah. And to be clear, this is more than just Casey and I. This is how do we operate as a management team and how do we ultimately make sure that we're remaining true to the end goal, which is what we talked about earlier, right? Yeah. How do we drive the right outcome for all of our employees and for the hacker community and for customers? Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's trust. It's it's no ego. And I think it, you also just have to have a personality match, right? Like we're, we're very fortunate where I it's consider Casey – a really good friend. You don't need to be really good friends to make this work, but it makes but it, it a hell of a lot easier, <laughs> yeah. right? If you yeah. actually genuinely like spending time with each other and you, you like being on similar projects or, or kind of working on things together versus like always dividing and conquering, right? Like that's powerful because now we can amplify how much we can get done. But in the same vein, like it is really yeah, powerful to be able to well, yeah. kind of sit down, lock ourselves in a room with a whiteboard and say, okay, this is what we actually need to work on. How do we go do it? Yeah. I think that, I mean, that sums it up well. Like when I, when I say trust, I, I mean that in all of its forms. I think there's yeah. the, you know, the professional version of that, the interpersonal version of that. Um, yeah, I think the idea of, of, I mean, even with what, what Dave said about ego, I, I kind of map that back to humility and that, and that kind of goes back to the skills, totally. like Venn circles yeah. that he was talking about before. Because my, my picture of humility is that it's not, oh, I'm terrible at everything, please help, which is, I think, how humility is often interpreted by people. I think that's wrong. That's false yeah. humility. Yeah. Like to me, it's, you know, if we go to the mat on these three things, I'm going to win because I'm world class. But then there's everything else and <laughs> I'm going to need yeah, help maybe. with that stuff. So to be able to operate like that and to be able to actually overlap where the strengths are um, and then complement the parts that aren't as strong mm. and then have obviously the relationship as a, as a you know, bridge to drive those buses across when you need to. I think all of those things to me, I've seen that work elsewhere. And, and you know what's been really nice working with Dave over this last season since he's taken up that role and you know it going on into the future is that we've we've figured that out pretty quickly i think yeah. we already had a pretty good idea that it would work out but yeah, yeah. in practice it's like oh cool this is working this is great <laughs> it, it's always nice to prove out that thesis yeah. right? it's, <laughs> it's always nice and i mean it definitely was like as as much as it's gone really well and and I, again incredibly grateful for kind of where we are at this this point in time there was a lot that had to get done there in a very it short was, amount of time. It was a bit of like work, yeah. <laughs> rebuilding a team, kind of reinvigorating the company from a growth perspective, getting all of the things aligned. Yeah. And in the same vein, you have a macro situation surrounding you that a lot of organizations are really struggling to get through. Yep. Right. And we're really fortunate where our business is growing 40, 50% year on year, every single quarter. Yep. So we're in a very different position than a lot of organizations. And it's how do we make sure we maintain that from an execution standpoint and at the same time continue to drive forward the cultural side of the business as well, yeah. right? This is not a sales-driven organization. It's not a product-driven organization. We're ultimately driving forward with a common set of goals and themes. Yeah. And it's there's going to be different pieces of prioritization at different seasons of the business. But ultimately, it's one single team, one single mission and kind yep. of driving that forward. Yep, yep. And I think props on top of that with the macro piece, like, okay, what does work look like? Yeah. You know, these days, like coming out of COVID, thinking about that that whole period, some of these team shifts and all those yeah. different things that's, that's happened. It's been, it's been a tremendously challenging period for every organization I've spoken to to understand how to define or redefine culture and how you execute on culture in a, hybrid whatever the hell that means yeah you know period and like you know we've had to focus on that part too so there's been all of these different things that have been effectively headwinds um yeah you know to execution that we've been able to pretty much blast through over the past 12 months which has been great so as a founder you go through lots of different kind of states at the different stages <laughs> of, of, of your entrepreneurial journey. I love the way you frame that. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know, you, you, start, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you start kind of, you know, really with excitement and then 
kind of the reality of, of startup. Obviously, it starts yeah. to kick in. Yeah. You start going through burnout. Obviously, you've gone through these different kind of states through your through your journey. And then you finally make the decision, I'm going to bring in someone that can help me. Yep. After you made that decision, how did you feel? Oh. Deep. Well, I've made it twice. He's got deep. <laughs> He's got deep. <laughs> well, it's, no, it's a, it's a really good. Well, I'm I'm thinking about because I mean the version after it's always it's always a weird thing. Yeah, like full stop, and and that's no indictment. On, did you start beating? <laughs> did you start perhaps beating yourself up and start questioning? Was I not good enough? Was 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 was? Did you start kind of really questioning yourself? Def made, made yeah, de definitely. The first go around, like part part of what I did, I was I was pretty deliberate. You know, the way I was rendering out the way that conversation happened. Um, the first go around, I'm leaving out the parts where I was very deliberate in maintaining control, and 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 influence over the selection process because mm -hmm. we went out and did a search and did all those different things. Um, you know, I took the chairman role and and basically just did everything that I could to reinforce externally and internally that I'm not checking out here. This is something that is, is something that I actually feel is best for the business, um, but something that I intend to stay involved in and will then shift into the process of trying to figure out what that means and what that looks like. Um, I think post decision, that shift is hard. Mm. Um, and that's when that's the stuff that you're talking about kind of really kicks in the whole like, oh, did I screw up and like, eh. You know, what could I have done better? I fundamentally don't believe in, like I do believe in regret because sometimes regret just happens. But the idea of dwelling in in like, oh, you know, it, it's kind of a waste. Did um, you question if you made the right decision? Oh yeah, for sure, 100%. Yeah. Um, but this is a part of what I go back to now with founders when when they're asking the same question. The, the funny thing about that, that process first time around was, um, you know, a whole bunch of founders reaching out on behalf of someone who totally isn't them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wanting to wanting to know like how did that work and how do you feel yeah. about it and all those different things because something about um something about the uh, the you know the founder CEO seat in particular that's not super intuitive is that it's insanely lonely when it comes to making decisions like this one. Like even talking to my spouse about it. Oh, do you think I should step back from CEO? Of course you should. You're working your ass off and you're like stressed all the time. Like, it's okay. almost a paralysis. Do you, do you find that if you didn't have that pressure of being at the top, you know, being the ultimate, you know, you weren't able to maybe execute those decisions and all of a sudden take... No, so, so, all right. So I'll get to the point that I was going to make there because that whole period of like, oh, does that, you know, it, it definitely feels like letting the team down to some degree. Yeah. And there's all those different things. There was a bunch of things to happen from a, from a team transition standpoint that... You know, frankly, I look back at and and you know those those are almost regrets, not quite, because I think a lot of the bug crowd diaspora have gone on and done phenomenal things, and and we all we've all stayed quite close, and I'm insanely proud of them, and the fact that we we're a part of their journey through that early phase as well. So those things are all good, but looking back through it all, I'm like, okay, how could I have avoided that? And and that's that's to me the productive output of feeling a bit like I've failed frankly, through, through that season. Um, a lot of that comes to delegation, like the stuff that you were talking mm -hmm. about before. Um, you know, I had, I had a close group. I had a phenomenal group of kind of early stage, you know, operators. Um, didn't really have a lot of management experience in terms of being able to hand off the operational or the business side of things. And one thing I would have done differently is, is basically taken uh, probably... I'm trying to think of who it would have been, and that's probably not appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> but the idea of actually like understanding how to work with a COO and then fully throw the weight yeah. of that side of the business onto that person. If I'd have done that about two years before this all popped up, I probably would have avoided it. Yeah. Um, downside of that is that maybe I wouldn't have met Dave, mm -hmm. right? So like, I, I think everything kind of works out. Happened for end, a right? reason. Yeah, yeah I don't the, really, yeah. I don't really look at it as a, oh, the guardian like, angel. But that's right. Like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but thinking about it through the lens of okay, if I get founders coming to me and asking about these same questions, yeah. like what advice? I don't yeah. want to just go to them and say, oh, I, was, you know, I screwed up and because I don't believe that's true. Mm. I, I do believe that all of these journeys play out in a certain way for a reason. Um, and this is part of you know the lessons that I learned from that process that I, right. I now get to pass forward 
So, so, so what would the best advice be? Do you know, if a founder approaches you and says, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure, right? I'm thinking, you know, this is my baby on the one hand. On the other hand, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm at burnout. I'm tired. You know, they've obviously got, they're at conflict. What, what's the advice you give them at that point? Yeah. Um, so the at burnout part, let's take that off the table for a second because I think that's a different yeah, that's a different conversation. Um, <clears throat> I think anyone who's in the founder CEO, CEO role, you should be able to like look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I the right person to be running this thing and be completely unafraid to do that? Like if you're scared to ask that question, that's going to be your first problem, right? So, so the, because, you know, going back to what I was saying before, like you'll always be its parent, but at some point, you know, it might leave home and as its parent, you want the best for it. So to be able to start to like, you know, separate your thinking out um, from being the person who's like kind of controlling and steering the thing to, okay, I'm, I'm releasing it into being what it can be. That's a really important thing to get your head right on as a founder, especially when it starts to work, right? Um, I feel like I actually did that part reasonably well. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's probably the first bit. Um, you know, the second bit would be, take the parts that you suck at that are critical to the business. Um, like the way I've always grown early stage teams is look at the things that I'm not good at first and then try to build into that, but then have enough of a Venn circle overlap that, that we're kind of all working together, which works out to about 20 people. And then you've got to start to instantiate hierarchy and things like that. But if you're talking about that initial group, like that's how I've traditionally done that and it works really well. Um, but you've got to stack rank that as well. So what are the things that are critical to the business? And then how can I make sure that I've prioritized that part and then thrown the weight of that onto that person? So that's the trust piece that, that we were talking about before. Because mm -hmm. looking back, that's the part that I didn't do very well. Like I kept on trying to take those pieces back and that mounted up and mounted up and mounted up to the point where it was, you know, kind of causing burnout. It's, uh, it's kind of the same way that you scale an organization or a business, yeah. even at this stage it's not that of the company, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's... How do we make sure we've got the right people in the seat that have headroom? If we yeah. feel like they're approaching their ceiling, how do we up level them? How do we get them to the point of kind of coach them up to yeah. being able to take on more and, and bigger pieces? And in some cases, you do have to realize that every one of us has a time and a piece of the journey that we're going to be here for. Right? Yeah. Like I talked about earlier, yeah. like I'm not the guy to come in at a really early stage business. Right. I can come in at the 10, 12, 15 million. Great. I can help scale. I'm not the early stage guy. Hmm. And I think there's a lot of people too that may not be the scale up side. Right. So it's so a lot of what you're talking about, you went through as a founder. Hmm. We're going to go through that again. Yeah. Right. And making sure that yeah. we have the right people around the table. And then when we get the right people around the table, how do we make sure that we get the hell out of their way? Exactly. And support them as much as we can. Like, the orchestration piece becomes just as much of how do I remove obstacles, right? How do I make sure that as folks are looking to do things, whether that's externally, whether that's helping the go-to-market team, whether yep. that's internal obstacles, board obstacles, whatever it might be, like that's a big piece of this so that ultimately the people that we bring on board to help operate the company day-to-day -day can, can actually go yeah. do their thing and, yeah, and be effective doing it. Yeah, it's it, and I, this is like one of the things that I've actually really – treasured from the decision to stick around mm. all this time because i think yeah. there was there was definitely a period there where it was like yeah like i'm not sure if this is going to continue in the direction i want it to if it's not then i'm gonna you know detach in, myself mm. yeah one part everything yeah. i can from a value yeah. standpoint and then peace out and sleep for about six months because <laughs> <laughs> i'm a founder and that's what we do um <clears throat> and and the decision to stay was was really mostly informed by you know my belief in the vision and the potential of the company and the fact that i wanted to see it in the best hands possible and that's kind of what ultimately let us hit yeah um but what that's given me the opportunity to to see over that time um, is that yeah, what you just said is exactly exactly true. Like a lot of these principles, they they change in terms of their nature. You know, the people that you're bringing in, um, the skills they have, the kind of outputs you expect, like their context, all those different things. But the fundamentals aren't that different. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. Like if if you if you make sure that you got those parts right, um, then it's just a matter of scaling on top of that and yeah. contextualizing it to the point of the business that you're yeah. in. 
Dave, when you joined as an advisor, did you initially start advising from a, a go-to-market CRO revenue perspective or did you come yeah. into... Yeah, so it was it was on the go-to-market side. It was also specific to how do you do go-to-market within cyber, right? right. So yeah. within <laughs> not just the broad cyber landscape, but then you kind of narrow in on, okay, application security. And then within AppSec, there's a lot of different angles to it, whether it's the development side of AppSec, kind of the perimeter side of AppSec, what we do from a crowdsource standpoint, like there's a lot of pieces to that market. So it was more about, okay, as somebody that's running a fairly large revenue organization, operational organization at White Hat, how do we then help organizations that at the time, I don't know how big bug crowd was at that point, but maybe 15 to 20% of the size of, of White Hat at that point. So yeah. it was, okay, we had just come through a lot of what bug crowd's about to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what you should do. And here's what you probably should try to stay away from. Uh, because we tried that and it didn't work or whatever it was. Mm. Yeah, because we often, obviously, you know, there's, we, uh, Simon alluded at the very beginning part of this show, obviously we're very entrenched in the playbook community and, and we talk to many, many reps, many sales individuals that yeah. find it really hard to apply the playbook and medic against um, in, in the cybersecurity market. Yep. Um, any advice you can give and how have you been able to kind of build the the Dave um, playbook or adjust the day playbook so that fits. So very early in my career, one of the VCs at Veracode said something really interesting, and this has stuck with me to, to today. You're going to sell to the same hundred people for the rest of your career. They're going to move to all <laughs> different companies. They're going to move to all different organizations, but whether it's 110 or 90, it's going to be around a hundred people that you sell to throughout your career. And you have to become a trusted advisor to them, yeah. even more so within cyber. Because CISOs and heads of cyber are being told on a daily basis by vendors, we can solve it all. You won't get breached if you buy my tool, right? And they say these things. The reality is none of that is true. It's all about defense and depth. It's about adding the layer. It's about having the processes and the methodology around the tool set, right? Some of the largest breaches in the world that we've seen had every tool under the sun, right? So it's how do you approach those conversations as a trusted advisor? Yep. How do you approach those conversations with empathy, right? It is really hard to be a CISO in 2023, about to go into 2024. That's only going to get harder. So these are folks that, I mean, we talk about burnout, on the founder side or burnout on the, the executive side, the burnout on CISOs today is unbelievably it's high. Mm. So it's how do you approach those conversations? You can still run your sales methodology, right? Mm. You can still have metrics that you're using to sell, but make sure they're believable. Yeah. Don't come in with, we're going to save you 700% R. Stop. Like that's stop. Like that's not going to be believable. It's, hey, this is what we can help you drive. This is how we can make your team more efficient. We know you're struggling with headcount. We all are. So this is some of the things that we can do. Or and here's, here's evidence that we can step into your problem right. with you. And it comes Not back just, to, yeah. especially in cyber, it's so reference-based hmm. that if you don't have strong relationships with your customers and your customers aren't out advocating for what you do and who you are as an organization, it's not going to work. Yeah. So again, you can run the medic playbook, you can run the process, but remember, it's a framework. Yeah. It's not a it's not an SOP manual that you drop on the table and I, this is going to work everywhere I am. The framework's going to work. The 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 thinking behind it's going to work, but you still have to tailor it to your market, your business, your style, yeah. and how do you drive? I mean, there's things like decision process. Well, you can run the decision process mm -hmm. no matter what you're selling, right? You need to understand what the customer's process is. Can I influence? Great. If I can't, then what does that mean for me and my deal or the economic buyer? Like that is all there, but you have to approach it with much more empathy. You can't be that in-your-face salesperson that maybe you can if you're selling to a CRO because we're a little bit more used to dealing in that environment. In terms of your unique journey, you've come from sales. Yep. You've made the transition to CEO. There's lots of people that, you know, lots of our listeners, lots of our viewers that are obviously thinking about career progression and thinking, yeah. you know, what's next for me? And I imagine quite a few of them do fancy themselves to kind of take that 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 step to CEO. Yeah. What advice would you be giving to those individuals that are perhaps considering that or thinking about going in that route with their career? Careful what you ask for. <laughs> uh, I was waiting for that. You, you, you might, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you've got to understand what do you really want to do, right? There are a lot of pieces of being a CRO and being in front of customers that I miss. 
Mm. Right. You, you have that. Yeah. It's the highs and the lows, right? You have the, the roller coaster journey. You're going to have that in every role, but I think you, you lose the ability to have like you're in the trenches working on deals and there is something that's fun about that. Mm. It, it all, it, for for anyone that wants to make the move and jump into a CRO role, make sure you have a damn good team. Because I've said this a few times now, I would not want this job without the team that I have. Mm-hmm. Right? I probably wouldn't have taken the role here at Bug Crowd had I not had the ability to kind of bring the team together. Right? Yeah. As great as Casey is, the two of us cannot do this together. 100%. We need a really strong team around us yep. to be able to do this. So build your network start identifying people in your own kind of ecosystem that, okay, this is somebody that I've got a really good understanding of finance and let's go tap that person. And even as you're a salesperson, start to learn the different pieces of the business so that you're not just viewed as the salesperson, right? You're viewed as somebody that has cross-functional understanding. And that's for me is also the difference between a VP of sales and a CRO. Yeah. Right. There's a sophistication that comes with that. So start to learn the market, learn the business, learn the different business functions, and then ultimately kind of decide, is this something that I really want to do? Because it is a very big change. Yeah. Is there any, you know, if you're identifying whether I've got the right soft skills for that role, what are some of those soft skills that you really need to consider to be good at the job, the job of a CEO? You have to love coaching people. Okay. Because it's no longer your success. Yep. It's always your failure. So to be clear, right, if the business doesn't do well, that's the CEO's job to stand up and say, I failed. But anytime something goes well, your team did well. Hmm. So you have to truly love seeing other people succeed. Like that has to bring you as much joy as you closing the deal yourself, right? It's almost like when you move from a a sales rep to a sales manager, right? You have some of that. This is even more so like, do you truly appreciate seeing the product team come together and come up with this amazing idea? And then what does that journey look like? And, and you have these kind of journeys throughout the different stages of the businesses, but you've ultimately got to love building a really good team and then helping make them successful, right? Because it is not about you anymore. Like you're there, you're taking the brunt of it, you're taking the heat for it. But as we talked about earlier, you're not getting the day-to-day air cover. You're not getting the day-to-day ability to impact it. So you do have to trust and just kind of let go and say, I've got to believe that I can help you in the background and I've put the right people in the seat at the right time for the current journey that we're on. And then I'm just going to get out of the way and I'm here to remove obstacles. It's, I have just one question, which is obviously, again, just, you know, you obviously had, I'm assuming you had a CRO in place before they became more an advisor. When you saw this elite way of selling and you, you were exposed to this playbook, you know, that we know so much about, you know, how, what, what went through your mind? Could you clearly differentiate that, that form of sales in comparison to what you had experienced before? Yes, yes and no. I think I I could differentiate, um, that form of selling from, from what we currently had in place at Bug Crowd at the time. Um, to me, like the, the way that Dave, you know, going back to bit of career history like yeah. doing the pen test thing on the technical side for a period and then shifting across into solution based selling um for for a couple of years of my career i i didn't get taught medic but this was mm. sort of just how i'd sold right. right um because as a practitioner and and as someone who can natively develop solution empathy or problem empathy with with a buyer as someone who kind of, you know, causes half the problems, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was just a, a natural way for me to do stuff. And, and to me, like it, it didn't really, like any other way of selling didn't really seem yeah. like a intuitive thing or a logical thing. Right. So what I knew was that um, Bug Crowd wasn't necessarily selling in that way. Mm. And then, you know, when these guys started coming in and implementing that type of thing, it's like, okay, this is, I get it now. Like I, I actually understand how this fits in to a, to a picture of, you know, how I kind of natively saw sales work. Um, it's also it, the predictability. The predictability, like That's yeah. the power of medic. That's the power of a really strong sales process. Is, yeah. Yeah, to your point, like a lot of this should be instinctual. Like that's where yeah. sales processes that are changing who you are, like that's not the right way to approach it, right? Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's how, do you, how do you give yourself a framework that you can then follow and absorb and adapt to? Yeah. 
but it's it, what it drives from a business standpoint is how does that make us more predictable? How 100%. does that help like, us from a scale? Line, linearity was night and day. Like, mm-hmm. you know, forecasting to target was night and day. Um, you know, the ability to even have <clears throat> proper kind of feedback from the pipeline into unit economics that informs product night and day. Like, that was all guesswork. Yeah. Basically prior prior to this stuff. So, like, those have been some, <laughs> some very, you know, practical... Um, <laughs> Hurts not my to, heart. It hurts my heart a little bit. Not to put too fine a, not to put, not to put too fine a point on it, but yeah, guess, guesswork in the sense of like you know going back to what I said before, like we had we we've, we've always had this very kind of compelling um, yeah. proof of life statement in in the market, and I think one of the one of the um, kind of the downsides of starting a company that does that is that you can confuse that with product market fit, mm. right? It's like okay, everyone has this problem. We've got a solution to this problem. Everyone yeah. wants to buy it great we've figured out pmf and we can just crank the handle now hold hold the phone like not necessarily true because that assumes that you've got your sales motion in place that yeah. your route to market styled in that unit unit economics are right you figured out you know differences in motion between geos differences in motion between like sizing verticals all those different things and we pretty quickly learned that that wasn't true um after we started to scale things early on in in, in bug crowd days um when this stuff started to get proper repeatability back into it then all of a sudden we can start to look at the overall you know product to market fit from a unit economic standpoint and, yeah. and clean it up and continue to innovate on that too so what's the what what does the journey at bug crowd look like going forward from here then what's uh what's what's the big plan what's the big vision where are you where are you yeah. going who wants it? Yeah. Who wants it? Well, this is, 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 this, is this the point where you let go of the vine? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, all right, we found, we found the line. No, I think I, I can mean, answer this, that question. I just, yeah, this, this is one that we both like. Part of the joke here is that we both are excited talking about this, right? Yeah. Because mm, we 100%. finally feel like we're at a point with this business that it is truly ready for prime time, right? Mm. It's ready to scale. We're seeing growth in the fifties, right? Like that doesn't happen at a business this size, especially in the market conditions that we're in. So we finally feel like we've got that flywheel going. So as we now fast forward, it's great. How quickly can we get to an immense scale where we're profitable, where we're driving the right customer outcomes, we're driving the right shareholder outcomes that ultimately open up a lot of doors for us. So if we look at the next 12 months, well, we're gonna grow this thing 40 to 50% next year. We're going to add 100 plus people to the business, right? Those are the things that we're really excited about from a tactical perspective. But from a market vision standpoint, it's how do we, there's so much that this platform and this community is capable of doing. So how do we continue to work with our customers, work with the community to identify, hey, this is what we need. This is a gap that exists in the market today. And this is where we want to take this thing long term. And that's the part that gets us really jazzed is, all right, we finally have the team and the platform and the product and the organization to go execute on this. Now we get to be solely focused on operating and executing the business and all of the BS is kind of to the side at this point, right? Yeah. So now it's, this is the fun part. Now we get game. to play from a from a, right. from a vision. Cause I mean, it's it's always been the fun thing about Bugrat. It's it's part of what's so profound about its value, but from an, uh, an execution standpoint, like yeah. you can't eat the, you know, the entire elephant all at once. So the That's question right. becomes which parts do you eat next? And, um, yeah, I think for us, like the elephant itself is huge. Like the next parts go, go back to, <laughs> go back to what Dave was saying before. Like yeah. the core of it is how do we drive return on investment in as profound a way as possible for the, for the customers that we're defending and for the hackers that are contributing. And then for us, what are we doing in the middle with the data and all of the technology, the use of, you know, ML, AI, all of those bits in the middle to facilitate that, to make the whole thing go faster. And it's literally just a flywheel. So, you know, I think making that part of what we've actually built more evident to market, yeah. um, that's a big part of what I see, you know, happen over the next yeah. 12 months. Because I do think that we've been, our category just in general has been bucketed as a bug bounty platform yeah. space, which annoys the hell out of me, frankly, mm-hmm. as the kind of the person who broke ground on the category itself. Um, but, you know, it makes sense because bug bounty was the term we used to explain to people that hackers aren't always evil back in 2013. So it <laughs> yeah. kind of stuck and, and we're in the process of explaining our way yeah. beyond that. The reality is we do so much more than that. We always have. Yep. Um, so part of it's articulating that out to market so they understand that and they're interacting with us in that sort of way and then expanding into adjacencies beyond what we're doing right now. 
Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds amazing. There's, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot there. I mean, it's, it's, it is an incredible story, an incredible journey. And I think this is the time when we kind of reflect on what we've spoken about today. Um, obviously, this is a very, very unique dynamic, having a founder and a CEO, yeah. you know. And, and I think this is a great example of it really working in a very symbiotic way. And yep. I think there's this... It's evident that there is this 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 trust and this unity, and I think there's a couple of things that are really key to that because you know a founder goes through different stages in their kind of development, and at the hmm. you know there's there's this this urge to to hold on to things and and a lot of the time it's the ego it's the ego that's holding hmm. on you it's keeping you holding on to things when perhaps you know you you should take the time to reflect and say. Am I doing the right thing for my company? And, and I think once you've actually got that dynamic, the ego then needs to be matched by the person that's coming in as your CEO because they obviously have to respect the, the founder as well. And I think what's very unique about this is that you've got two individuals where the ego is left to one side and you're just focused on how can we build the best business we possibly can. And I think yeah. it's it's amazing to see in evidence in all its glory how this could really work. And, and I'm hoping that founders that do listen to this show are inspired by that sellers that are, that listen to this show i want to understand you know what could be available to their career yeah. they take inspiration from this so i just want to say a massive thank you i really appreciate you coming yeah. and joining us in the studio today it's been a real blast and you know we're really looking forward to see how this journey continues to blossom between you thanks for yeah. having us yeah this was a ton of fun thank you super well thanks ever so much so to all our listeners, thank you so much for joining. If you've liked what you've heard, please do subscribe to our various channels, iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. All the links are in the description below, and we look forward to welcoming you back for another session soon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>